So uh, anyone know those two that are pictured there? This one over here. Any guesses? Missouri? Uh, no, but this one is over here. This is Missouri over Missouri? here. Solidago Missouriensis, Missouri goldenrod. Over here on the left side is Solidago speciosa, Missouri goldenrod. These two uh, demonstrate two of the three types of inflorescences that we're going to be using to help sort these guys out. I added a few more sources for photographs down here. Uh, this Astro E lab by John Semple. Uh, he's the guy that is the Solidago expert. Uh, he's got uh, every Solidago in North America on that website and described with some photos. Cal Photos is another good place to get pictures. These are all pretty reliable places to get photographs if you ever need some. Most of them have a policy where if you're going to use the um, photo just for educational purposes, then there's no charge, of course. All right, so let's take a look at Solidago a little more closely. So wanted to start just with um, kind of what makes a Solidago, first of all. And, and let's uh, describe where the name comes from. So Solidago, uh, the scientific name Solidago comes from uh, the Latin name solidus, which means whole, and ego, which means to make. And so the reference there is to make whole again, so to speak. So it refers to uh, medicinal healing properties that many species of um, solidagos um, apparently have. It is a member of the Asteraceae, and we we discovered and and reviewed Asteraceae last week with Symphyotrichums. So you know what makes it a part of this family? Of course, it's the inflorescence that's ahead or Compitulum, a, a mass of small, tiny, tiny florets. Uh, it has that involucre, which you know is a group of fillories or involucre bracts that sit around, uh, and some ten, kind of around the, the base of of the of the head. And it has a pappus, which again is a modified calyx. Going down further, the next taxonomic rank for it is the Asterii, which is a tribe. And so this was going to really start breaking, of course, that huge Asteraceae family out into smaller groups. And um, Solidagos uh, with um, Symphotrichum and many other species, of course, that other genera in the, this tribe, they're all kind of um, you know unified by these two characteristics here. The receptacle. Now remember, the receptacle is this this base down here. It's the base of of the head inflorescence. It's the surface where the florets are attached. So these receptacles in Asteri are described as being more or less naked. And what that means is that they don't have chaffy bracts. There's little chaffy bracts. You can actually see some chaffy bracts in this down here. These are called receptacular bracts or chaff. Another term for receptacular bracts is palei. Uh, but uh, some of the Asteraceae, and in fact, next week when we talk about sunflowers, that will be um, a genus that does have these bracts. Uh, so again, this is the important characteristics that again separates out these tribes. Now, um, Asteraceae doesn't have these. Again, it says chaffy bracts are not present. Uh, Turns out Solidago is just a little bit of exception there because the Solidagos can have a few of them around the margin of the uh, re receptacle. Now uh, the ray florets are pistillate like they're normally supposed to be. Uh, this dollar sign is a symbol that I use kind of like the plus minus sign means more or less or generally dollar sign is just a quick shorthand for sometimes. Uh, sometimes the corollas on those ray florets are really short and um, uh, sometimes kind of hard to see. The disc florets are perfect as they normally are. They have yellow corollas and are usually always five lobed. And in the Asteraceae, the pappus has many capillary barbellate bristles. Here's some, some images of what a pappus looks like. Capillary, uh, capillary, I should say, means just means slender. Barbellate means that they have little barbs on them. You can see on this um, magnified pappus here that 
there are little barbs that point upwards. All right, so that again unites all of these and other genera into Asterii. If you look at what makes it then in the genus Solidago, all of these characteristics here. So that head inflorescence is another, again, is a radiate type. We, we looked at the radiate type last week with symphotrichums, again, meaning that it's got both uh, ray florets and disc florets, both. The, um, here's that receptacle uh, characteristic again. So it's, it's slightly convex. Um, there can be a few of those paley present, as I said, sometimes a few marginal ones. But otherwise, again, that receptacle is naked, doesn't really have any, any of those chaffy bracts. And instead, it has little tiny ridges that kind of surround the base of those, those florets. Uh, involucres are three to 10 millimeters in general. The filaries tend to be lancelet. You can see this uh, nice diagram here that um, Richard Lutz took uh, showing what the filaries look like, the bracts here. They usually are in three to five series. This shows three of them here. Uh, Semple says that the bracts have, these filaries have a translucent midrib. Not really sure I can see that on these here. It looks like there might be a little bit of a translucent one right there. So maybe that kind of varies a little bit from one to another. Uh, the ray florets are pistolate. But now we can say that they're also, they also have yellow corollas, almost always. <laughs> There's always exceptions, you know. So um, by and large, all solidagos have ray flowers with yellow corollas, except for one species, rarely white. Again, those disc florets are perfect. And again, they have yellow corollas, but again, rarely white, uh, same species. And now we can see that uh, in Solidagos, the pappus actually occurs in two series. So there's two rows of them uh, there at the uh, top of the fruit, uh, usually 25 to 45 of those bristles. And you can see, again, this is um, Solidago altissima here. This is canadensis. So what we're looking at here is the fruit, which is called a cypsella. That's the term that's used to describe the fruit. And the pappus, uh, again, attached to the top of it here. And we can see that it looks like there's a, there is a bit of a difference. This is actually a pretty good difference to separate these two species. We'll talk more about um, tall goldenrod and cannon goldenrod. They can be very difficult to separate, and they are. Uh, but this is one characteristic that is pretty good and pretty consistent if you can dig down into the uh, disc flowers there and find some, some fruits that are um, far enough along to, to be um, char characteristic. And what I'm seeing here is, and you can see it here very easily, is that the pappus in uh, canadensis here is shorter than the pappus in altissima. Uh, and it's pretty, pretty noticeable. I'll have some measurements uh, I think some measurements are in the, the key. <clears throat> All right, so that, that tells us what, um, what characteristics then really narrow down and, and tell us we've got a goldenrod. Any questions here? This is a nice diagram, or excuse me, a nice uh, photo that Richard took of um, a disc floret from Solidago uh, rigida. And this diagram up here is to get a nice uh, diagram. This comes from the Astro-E website. Uh, again, shows kind of a cutaway diagram of what um, a capitulum looks like in Solidago. Uh, we've got part of the involucre cut away here, part of it in place here, so we can see the, the filaries. We can see that there is sort of a translucent midrib uh, di diagrammed on, on these. Then we can see uh, you no know, array floret here and some disc florets. And the pappus. We got one question asking about uh, if you're gonna address hybridization. Yeah, so in hybridization, uh, there are some hybrids in Solidago. It does occur in Solidago, um, not nearly as common as in Symphotrichum. 
Uh, one hybrid that I've come across is um, it's a hybrid between uh, Solidago canadensis, Canada goldenrod, and Solidago uliginosa, which is a bog go goldenrod. But by and large, uh, yeah, they're not, they do occur, but they're just, they're not nearly as common as you have in the asters. All right, let's take a quick look at um, the list, the, the table again. And I'm gonna have to, I'll have to get out of this briefly and pull up um, the Word file here. <clears throat> and uh, I also expanded the glossary uh, in this one, built upon what I had last week, added some more diagrams of uh, important terms that and really what this glossary is trying to do is just mainly focus on terminology that's used in the in the PowerPoint. Added some more terms here, reproductive terms, vegetative terms. We'll be using lots of these terms tonight. But I want to take a look at the table here quick, uh, go through this table. So this is like last time, uh, Simfil Tricum table. This is a, kind of built this as a reference table just to list all the species. There are um, currently 16 species of solid ego in Iowa, uh, according to Flora of North America. Uh, I also wanted to point this out because I didn't point this out last week. So these range maps that you see here again from BONAP, um, I use them because they do provide, of course, the, a nice picture of the geographical range in the United States outside the borders of Iowa. It's nice to see what the range is in Iowa, of course, but you get a better picture of that species, uh, the whole the whole picture of that species when you can look at this. But I uh, wanted to point out that I would not use these maps unless you really had to uh, for designing seed mixes and determining whether a species was present in your region of the state. Uh, if you're if you're looking at prairie seeding, I would first go to the range maps in the, the uh, book, Iowa Prairie Plants uh, to do that because those range maps are going to be more accurate when it comes to what the native distribution was for that species. And if you don't own that book, you can go see it right here. There's uh, that, that book is online at this website here. All right, so this is just like last week. Uh, I won't bother, I guess, describing everything, but I wanted to kind of just do a quick rundown of the species here. So uh, solid egg altissima, that was not identified as a species in Iris and Rosa. It was combined with canadensis, but Flora of North America, as you can see, has broken it out. And it is then essentially a new species, you know, for the state, uh, but it's a taxonomic one, of course. And uh, we have both of the subspecies that Florida of North America lists uh, in the state. And as you can see on the map here, it it's, it's occurs everywhere. Uh, it's a very, very widespread species. It's considered to be the most, probably the most common of the uh, uh, species in this complex of the golden rods called the Solidago canadensis com complex. And um, it used to have a coefficient of zero, but it's been bumped up to two, along with uh, Canada golden rod here. I'll talk a little bit more about these when we get to the PowerPoint on these, but uh, canadensis, we have one of the two subspecies, hard to is the one that we have, according to Flora North America. But I think uh, we probably also have some variety of canadensis as well, um, probably more so in the eastern part of the state, maybe the northeastern part of the state. Uh, Flexicollis or zigzag, uh, pretty much throughout the state. Uh, Gigantea, again, this is another one that's similar to Canadensis and Altissima in that complex with them. Uh, again, very, very widespread everywhere. This is one that you'd find in you know, damper environments. We'll talk about this triple vein leaf uh, in just a little bit. Hispida is one that is uh, way at the top here for coefficients, a 10, and it's found mainly in Northeast Iowa and along the Des Moines River Valley. If, um, if you're in central Iowa, you've been to Ledges Park, uh, there's a population out there uh, growing in um, kind of a north, northeast uh, music uh, forest slopes. Missouriensis, uh, one of those pictured at the very beginning there is a species of, of prairies, drier prairies. 
Now, mollus, uh, this is a new species, and it's listed in Florida, North America as being present in Iowa. And Bonap has it present in Iowa too, because that's why this state of Iowa is green there. But I don't really see um, what county it's in. And I don't know what the history of that record is. I'd have to uh, check the herbarium at Iowa State and do some investigation there and see. Uh, it is a great plain species, as you can see. So I suspect that, there, that probably when the uh, floor of North America treatment for golden rods was done by John Semple and Emily Cook, they, and they looked at the vouchers at Iowa State, they found a solid mollus in the vouchers uh, that was misidentified as something else, per, perhaps. Uh, but I, would, I would suspect it's probably way up in Northwest Iowa. Nemoralis is the gray golden rod, a real common one again in drier kind of uh, lower fertility types of environments. Again, we can see we've got two of the, both of the subspecies are present in the state that are listed in FNA. Uh, Petula, now again, um, the ones that are highlighted are the ones we're going to um, look at more closely. All of these are in the key uh, that you have, uh, but we're not going to, I'm not going to include mollus because it's, you know, this is not one that you're going to probably come across, of course. Uh, the idea is to, to look more closely at those that are going to be more common for you to come across. Likewise, Petula is, is not one that you're going to come across. This is an endangered species in Iowa. Uh, you can see that uh, it's more eastern, of course. The, uh, the lone site is in Muscatine County, uh, down in southeast Iowa, in um, a wet type of environment. Tarmacoides, uh, the upland white goldenrod, that's the one that's white, of course. Um, this is one that is mainly north of us and a little bit to the northeast of us, but you can find it uh, down into central Iowa. Verdelii, uh, another. Um, I wouldn't say real common, but not, not, not that hard to find. Again, the northern half of Iowa, for the most part, wet environments. Rigida is real common prairie species, as you can see there. I think that's in every single county there um, and widespread from the Great Plains into the, the tall grass prairie regions. Uh, Schiaphala is a cliff goldenrod. That one is only, as you can see, is only really found in the uh, driftless area. Uh, primarily of Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Cliff goldenrod. Then speciosa, the one that we had looked at at the beginning, showy goldenrod. A little explanation here real quick. You can see that um, there are two subspecies and two varieties listed in, F in FNA. Uh, three of those are supposedly in Iowa, according to FNA. Uh, what these little squiggly lines, and you don't have those on yours, unfortunately. I, I don't think you do anyway. I think I added these. Um, is that in a paper since the floor of North America, which was, came out in 2006, sample in a paper in 2017 has now demonstrated there's good evidence to split out three more species from these subspecies and varieties. He's saying in, his, in this uh, recent paper, there will be a Solidago polita, uh, a, a species of um, uh, speciosa here is, is not speciosa, it's um, it is Solidago jejunifolia. And then there will be another one, Solidago rigidia scula. And again, so there'll be two new Solidago species in Iowa based on that taxonomic. Uh, splitting out. I don't have those uh, calculated into the mix here. Uh, that paper came out in 2017, and um, I really haven't really seen much more about them than that. Then finally, uh, Eluginosa, that's another one that's not included in the rest of this because, again, it's an endangered species. There's only one observation in only one county uh, up in um, Northeast Iowa, Alamakee County. Uh, and it wasn't, it hasn't been observed since 1989. So uh, it'd be fun, you know, go out and look for these, but uh, so it'd be nice to know a little bit about them and the, the key will help you with that, but you're not going to, again, likely come across that one. Homofolia is a real common woodland species. Uh, note that it's somewhat absent from the northwest corner of the state, but otherwise pretty common throughout the state. And then a um, whole bunch of solid eagle species that 
currently not known to be in Iowa, but are in adjacent states. And I did highlight one of these, Solidago Juncia, because uh, there seems to be some reports that it's in Iowa, uh, but Eilers and Rosa never listed in Iowa, and Florida North America does not show it's in Iowa. Uh, so I don't know of any records that actually say that's in Iowa. Bonap says it's in Iowa, but I suspect the Bonap uh, are misidentifications or vouchers or some kind of observation that you know isn't um, verified very well. All right, any quick questions on this table? Um, we had one asking <clears throat> for seed mixes, is it best to avoid aggressively rhizomatic species for the initial, initial planting? Yes, <laughs> I would never, uh, you don't need to you know, add any uh, autissima or canadensis to any seed mix, generally speaking. Uh, you'll probably get that uh, just by seed dispersing in or it's going to be there in the seed bank. Uh, those two for sure you do not want to add. Uh, you know, Missouriensis uh, probably would be all right to add something like that if the ha habitat and the place were, were right. Uh, Gigantia, again, probably not. Uh, that one too is pretty, can be pretty aggressive. All right, let's jump back to the PowerPoint and look at those 13 species then. We drop, we're dropping three out of here that aren't very uh, likely to be found. Uh, let's go back to PowerPoint. All right, so splitting up these 13 solid eagles, the way to approach this is to use the inflorescences to separate them into these three groups, A, B, and C. Now, as we were looking at the uh, these florets here uh, and the heads, they're pretty consistent. You know, most most solidago uh, inflorescences and the florets look pretty similar. You're not going to use any of the characteristics really on these flowers to help figure out what you've got or to key it out. But you will use how those heads are arranged. Now, here's some terminology. Again, uh, um, I should have maybe reviewed, reviewed this while the glossary was up, but the, the glossary, in the glossary, it describes what an inflorescence is, and it also describes what a primary inflorescence is and a secondary one. And it's important to keep those two straight. The literature and the keys and the books don't really distinguish them very well, unfortunately. And so remember that in Asteraceae, in these solid egos, again, what we're looking at here is the primary inflorescence. This is how, this is how the flowers are arranged. The flowers, which are these tiny little florets, disc florets and ray florets, are arranged in this tight uh, group, tight cluster, you might say, uh, again, that we call a head or a capitulum. So how the flowers are arranged is the primary inflorescence. How the primary inflorescences, or in this case, how the heads or capitula are arranged is the secondary. So that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, what kind of secondary inflorescence do we have? And they separate, separate out again into these three groups. This group A have a secondary inflorescence that is more or less flat topped, as it says here. The term corymbiform is, uh, applies here because the corymb is a type of inflorescence that has an, an indeterminate growth, but has these longer branches that are lower and shorter branches that are higher. That's what makes then all of these heads pretty much on the same plane. Uh, they're not always perfectly flat top. They can be a little bit of a convex shape to them. Uh, but there's three species in Iowa, the upland white, the ridge and riddells, that are gonna come out into group A. Uh, then the rest of these are really, well, well, we don't really have too many, too, anything that really looks much like this. So we're gonna skip this one, um, for us at least. The rest of these all over here are described as being panicula form because uh, what, what we have here are basically panicles of heads. Uh, a panicle is a type of inflorescence that has branching aspects to it. 
And all of these have some kind of branching aspect to them. They may be little short branches in the leaf axles like we see right here, but that's, but that's still a branch. Uh, so that just means that they have this branching aspect. They, they separate into these two groups, group B, because the secondary inflorescence is generally fairly pretty elongated and you know, more or less cylindrical. There can be a lot of variation as you can see here, but they, another term that's uh, used to describe this is a wand or a type of a, you know, something that's shaped like a wand or shaped like a rod. And there's four species of these 13, there's four, the Shoy, Zigzag, Harry, and Cliff that are gonna be in this group. And then this last group, group C, uh, these are the ones that have, are best described as having sort of this pyramidal type of um, particular form secondary inflorescence, uh, being in, being broadest towards the base, narrowing towards uh, the top. Quite often, again, they have these branches that are curved, very curved like this, uh, arched, and usually have the heads, the capitula, are uh, just on one side, usually just oriented on uh, facing upwards, but with the heads on, on one side, like, as you can see here. And there are six, again, six species that then break out into group C. So the inflorescences are very, really very helpful, of course, in determining uh, which goldenrod you have. So we'll take a look at group A, the flat topped ones. And again, there's the three species that break out there. And it's really easy, of course, to break out the upland white goldenrod uh, because the disc and ray corollas are, are white. They can be a little bit more of a pale cream color, but uh, they are white. And that's the only uh, goldenrod, of course, in Iowa that's gonna have, uh, have white disc or ray cor corollas. And here's some pictures of uh, upland white. Then um, the other alternative in this key is, so then the disc and ray, that should be, corollas are yellow. So that takes us then to the second couplet and Riddell's and Rigid uh, are pretty easy to separate. I mean, they are way different in terms of the habitat they're gonna be in. Um, but you know, when you, when you write something like this and, and you can usually use habitat as a way to distinguish them, but it is nice to uh, use morphological characteristics too, in case you're looking at something that's been collected and you don't know where it came from. Uh, there, but there is a really big difference here. The, the Riddell's has these leaves that are fairly narrow. In fact, anytime the leaves are more than 10 times longer than wide, uh, we, we, we usually refer to that as being a linear type of shape. And that's what we've got here. So really long leaves. We look towards the base of these leaves where they attach to the stem. Uh, usually there's a little bit of some sheathing there. Uh, the leaves are completely glabrous, uh, margins are entire. On uh, rigid goldenrod, you can, you can see the quite different leaf shape, of course. The, the leaves are much broader and more of an oblanceolate ab ab or oblong elliptic kind of shape, less than three times longer than wide. Uh, lots of hairiness, of course, on, on rigid goldenrod. Um, the, the leaves are hairy, the stems are hairy. Again, a big difference between uh, those two species. They both have the, the uh, inflorescence that looks similar. If you look at this one here on Riddell's and look at this one on Rigid, they have that same kind of con somewhat convex, you know, dome-shaped um, sec secondary inflorescence, uh, but the rest of the plant uh, on down is vastly different. And of course, again, this one grows in wet environments and Rigid is in drier, um, music to, to dry types of soils. Any questions on these? Uh, we got a couple, I think three questions here. So the first one was asking about what the CC mean, the coefficient of conservatism. What does the coefficient of conservatism mean? Yeah. Okay, well, if you haven't uh, used the coefficient of conservatism, uh, I didn't really explain that last time either. I know, I know some of you do know what it is. But if you don't, it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, so the coefficient of, so coefficient of conservatism is just a, it's a coefficient, it's a number, it's an index that has been assigned to plant species by a group of field botanists who hopefully have a lot of experience 
in seeing that species out in the field and where they tend to see it. Um, the, the whole idea of, of um, this system of conservatism in plants was, was developed um, years ago by um, some guys in Illinois as a way of, of assessing the quality of a habitat. Because plants don't move, uh, they're immobile. They do, I think you can argue, they do sort of reflect the, the quality of that environment. Uh, so much more than an insect or a bird would, because an insect and a bird can, can move. And so the coefficient of conservatism is on a scale from one to 10, uh, plants that are very uh, widespread and in a sense actually benefit from human disturbance, such as uh, common ragweed or giant ragweed, they have a coefficient as low as you can go. In our, in our scale, it's one, maybe two. So these, you can think of a one and two or a three as, as somewhat uh, you know, rural or sort of weedy, but they're native species, of course, because only native species get, get a co coefficient. On the other hand, a species that it's only ever seen in very pristine, and by pristine, of course, I mean um, as natural and pristine as and, and undisturbed by humans as possible. And that, that's, that type of, of species, if it's really kind of restricted to those types of environments, is going to be up at the top. That's going to be an eight, nine, or 10. Another question? Yeah. Um, well, let's see. I've got a couple of questions about the change to oligoneron. I don't know how to say that. Oh. Um, so which, how many species are have changed? Okay, so I think that question is referring to the genus Oligoneuron. Oligoneuron was a genus that was proposed to represent the, these, these species right here, uh, the ones that have the, the flat top corymbiform secondary inflorescence. But, and, and well, and let me go, well, I guess I can't go back to the table. Um, that's why I use, and I encourage you to use Florida North America. I you know many of you may use the um, USDA plant database website, which I think uses oligoneuron. But um, as explained in FNA, in the discussion for Solid Eagle, uh, extensive molecular genetic work has shown that that group that some people are claiming should be separated out with a different genus called oligoneuron, that group, these three species here, for example, are completely nested within the solid eagle genus when you look at it from a DNA and molecular point of view. That means that those three species are right in the mix of solid eagle. They do not warrant separation out as a separate genus. Uh, that's why, uh, no offense to USDA plants, but USDA plants is, in my mind, is not using and, and understanding the most current and understood you know, systematics that's being done on these, on these plants. That's what FNA is all about. It's all about using the most recent knowledge and systematic work that's, that's been done to get the phylogeny right, as right as we can. Is there another one? Uh, well, someone asked some for a definition of capitulum, but I think it got answered. And then yeah. I think I, I did um, that one. Someone was asking if planting riddles in a non swampy yard will it require regular water watering? Well, I don't know. I mean, riddles is, is going to do much better if it's a saturated soil. That's where I see it in environments where the soil is, is saturated, it stays pretty wet. Now, it, it, you can see it in wet mesic prairies, which aren't technically wetlands, so they a little bit drier. And so plants have a plants have an, uh, quite a bit of plasticity ability to to um, acclimate again to the environment that they're in is what that means. So uh, you could probably get some to grow if if it's you know if you water it a lot. Um, I I would think. All right, let's move on to Group B. Okay, so group B, I'm going to separate into two groups. Remember, there's there's four species in this group. And one of them is going to come out really quick right here. Uh, this one right here. Um, 
Perry because uh, it's got a lot of pubescence. The stem below the inflorescence is pubescent, the upper surface of leaf blades are, are hairy, whereas the other three are pretty glabrous, meaning again, there's no, no hairs there. They're, the upper surface is what we're looking at here, not the lower surface, the upper surface. There can be some, you know, sparsely hair, some sparse hairiness on these, but uh, um, for the most part, again, more or less is a way of saying it. Uh, they don't, they don't have hairs. So hairy uh, then comes out here. That's Solidago hispida. And then the other three, um, I'm going to split out here with. Um, looking at the leaf margin. So we need to split out showy from zigzag or cliff right here with, with this couplet right here. And again, for the most part, the leaf margins on showy are going to be generally entire. It means there's not really any teeth there, uh, or there may be uh, what, what's called shallowly cellulate or crenulate. So really small teeth, uh, maybe uh, more sparsely uh, located along the edge. So again, entire or barely present with some teeth. Whereas down here, leaf margins are sharply and distinctly serrate, meaning there's no question about it. Uh, those leaves have, have teeth along the edge. Here we can see there's some difference in the um, leaves in terms of how long they are, four to five times longer than wide for showy. Down here, only about one and a half, two and a half times longer than wide. The subcellae are again are the fruits, and that that's in the in the glossary. Uh, up here and show you they're glabrous. That's what we're looking at right here. The subcellae, uh, no hairs on any of those. Whereas in these two down here, again you're going to see strongly strigose means there's hairs that are short and pressed down against the surface. And then the, there is a difference in the secondary inflorescence to some extent. And again, this is what showy generally looks like. Uh, it can vary. Those secondary inflorescences can vary quite a bit. But I, again, I tend to think of showy generally as having a, a fairly dense, compact secondary in, inflorescence. A lot of flowers in this um, dense cylindrical shape here. Whereas uh, zigzag and cliff are going to be much more open and much more diffuse. You'll see uh, them on the on the next slide. So those two, zigzag and cliff, are shown right here. And again, so yeah, you can see. Look at these. This secondary inflorescence, and and this one down here. This one here, not nearly as as packed in and dense as we, we what we saw there with with showy. So again, separating these two, zigzag and cliff. Well, again, remember cliff is really restricted ge geographically speaking. It's in Iowa. It's really only going to be on those um, Mississippi River cliffs up in northeast Iowa, maybe as far down as Dubuque or so. Uh, but no, again, vegetatively looking at these two, uh, cliff here is going to have the, the lower leaves, the basal and lower calling leaves are going to be clearly the largest really clear, really much larger and clear reduction in size as you go up the stem. That's what this means there. Leaves progressively reduce in size distally. Distally means um, up towards the top of, 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 the, of the plant, the stem. And, and this, is, this is important, again, as a, to separate it from zigzag, the stem, the stem, excuse me, is more or less straight. In zigzag, uh, its name comes from the fact that the upper portion of the stem can have this zigzag pattern to it where it uh, alternates kind of directions between nodes. You can kind of see that a little bit here on, on that plant. And again, in, in, in zigzag, uh, the basal and lower calling leaves are actually smaller than the longest ones, which are actually higher up on the plant. Um, usually about a third to a halfway up the plant or about the middle part of the plant is where the largest leaves are. And, and then the leaves get smaller as you go up, and they also get smaller as you go down, uh, which again is quite different from cliff. And here's a picture of a typical uh, zigzag leaf, or leaf, excuse me. All right, let's go to group C. We've got about 20 minutes left. So we've got six species to split out here. And so here, we're going to split these out into two groups, C1 and C2. And this is a really important characteristic. Um, 
because um, two of these do not have triple nerve leaves, generally speaking. Uh, there are, you can sometimes see uh, gray goldenrod maybe with what it looks like maybe three nerves, but it's pretty rare. So again, what this is saying here is those leaves up on the stem, the colleen leaves, they have a distinct midrib, but the other veination that you see there, the other weaker veins are more or less pinnate, a, a, a branching pattern coming off of that, that um, midrib and not triple nerve. Whereas uh, these species over here in C2 do have their colleen leaves, at least the main ones are triple nerve. Now, this is, a, this is a tall goldenrod leaf, which is in this category, and it's a little hard to see there. So that red line is the mid nerve. That's the, that's the strongest one going down the middle part of the leaf. That blue one is one, of, is one of the lateral nerves, and there's another lateral nerve right there, hence the term triple nerved. These, these two lateral nerves don't arise at the bottom, they rise a ways up from the base there, but they go pretty much parallel with the leaf margin, almost to the, uh, to the end of the leaf. And certainly over, for over half the length of the blade. So we're gonna separate out the other four species here. So the, again, the two species that are just single nerved in a sense then, not triple nerved, these are single nerved. Again, gray goldenrod and elm leaf, these do separate out somewhat by habitat. As you can see here, gray is going to be in drier, low fertility types of grasslands, uh, open woodland, uh, you know, lower fertility soils. Elm leaf is uh, definitely in a, a wooded environment. Uh, could be in some snow, maybe a closed savanna, uh, open woodlands, or even forest. Uh, they separate out otherwise on the basis of the gray being very densely pubescent with minute little hairs. And it really makes the surface of the leaves look kind of a dull green, basically kind of a grayish green. The leaf surface will have this grayish green look. Whereas um, elm leaf does have pubescence, as it says, moderately pubescent, but the hairs are longer. You can see the, the size of the hairs compared here. And these are mostly spreading and they're not quite as dense. So the, the leaf surfaces have this more of a clear uh, green look to them. But again, uh, it's always kind of hard to describe the inflorescences. Now the inflorescences on gray are, are pretty characteristic like you see right here. Usually uh, one or two of these branching curved um, branches. Whereas in elm leaf, you usually have uh, this type of inflorescence got lots of branches going off in all directions. You kind of see that here. You can see it on these right here. So again, um, pretty pretty different in terms of what those um, secondary inflorescences look look like, and and the leaves as well. Here you can see the pubescence on the leaves here, uh, kind of sparse and you know longer spreading kinds of hairs on the bottom side of, of this leaf. Here's the leaves on on gray. All right, let's look at the last um, four. So again, these have the triple veined leaves. So we're gonna split these out first into two groups based on pubescence. Um, two of them over here, the stem is glabrous, all of its length below the inflorescence. So don't look at the inflorescence, but look at the bottom of the inf inflorescence and then down. Uh, it's gonna be strongly glabrous. Uh, giant can have a few hairs in places, uh, but again, for the most part, um, it is without hairs. As it says, rarely with a few scattered spreading short hairs. That would be probably be in giant. Whereas these two over here, uh, stems pubescent, all or most of the length. I mean, it's, there's no doubt about it. Although what we're gonna talk about a little bit is uh, the two varieties or subspecies of Canada vary a little bit there. Um, so we're gonna deal with these two first. This slide deals with these two. We have, we've got Missouri pictured right here and giant pictured right here. So to separate Missouri and giant then, after you've looked and seen that the stems are hair hair hairless, now we're going to look, and so you do need an inflorescence for this. 
Now we're going to look at the inflorescence, the, the axis of the inflorescence, the main axis going through here, the branches, these branches coming out, and the pedicels, which are the little um, stalks that hold each of those heads, uh, all of those are going to be glabrous in Missouri, or for the most part. Whereas in giant, uh, there's going to be sparse to moderate amount of hairs there. So hairy up in here, glabrous down here. On Missouri, glabrous everywhere, everywhere. And then, um, <clears throat> And also on giant, you can see some other things here. Giant usually has sort of a uh, glaucus. I think I had that in there somewhere. Hmm. I think it, it might be on the, um, the, the uh, diagnostic characteristics I put into the table. But you can kind of see this glaucus here. Glaucus again means that there's a kind of a, this bluish, whitish, um, waxy covering on the surface that you actually can wipe off. Uh, and so that glaucous um, surface is, is pretty common on giant. Uh, it's also somewhat common to have sort of reddish stems on giant too. Here's the uh, underside of a giant leaf. There's the mid vein. There's a lateral vein. There's a lateral vein. You can see it's pretty glabrous, except there's just a few little hairs, tiny little hairs along the mid vein. Here's the uh, bottom side of Missouri. Again, more narrow, of course, but there's the lateral vein. There's a lateral vein. There's a mid vein. And again, no hairs at all here. All right, the last two then, again, the, the two that come off over here, tall and Canada, uh, they're covered right here. Lots of pictures here, and they're split into two sides. This side is tall, Solidigo altissima. This side is Canada, Solidigo canadensis. And this picture right here, which comes from a Minnesota website, uh, shows Canada and tall leaves side by side in the same picture. Uh, you can see that vegetatively speaking, one of the characteristics that might be useful here, because again, these, these two are, 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 are difficult because they both have hairs on the stem, sort of more or less, um, as you can see here. They both have the pyramidal, of course, secondary inflorescence. Their leaves are pretty much the same shape. We'll talk about a few other things. They both get galls. Um, one vegetative characteristic that could work is, again, looking at these leaves here. But the, uh, the warning here is that this one here is Saladego canadensis, variety canadensis, which again is, is the least common variety if it even occurs in Iowa. And again, FNA says it doesn't, but I suspect it probably does in the east. And, and so this one does look like it has a lot less pubescence. The pubescence is mainly on the veins here and not much pubescence um, between the veins whereas there's pubescence all the way across this one here. Which if you, if we could look at a leaf of Solidago canadensis variety uh, Harbor Dry, which is the more common uh, variety, it would look just like this. It has, it has hairs all the way across. So, so this is, is, it doesn't look quite as you know, useful as it might here, depends upon which variety of canadensis you have. So what does separate them? Well, here's what we have from the key. Um, the involucres, most keys use the size of the in involucres here, uh, tall having larger ones than Canada. And again, what we're mean here, the involucres is, is this distance right here. So over three millimeters in tall and two to three in Canada. This is what I usually use to uh, separate them. However, uh, there's a little bit of a problem with this too because one of the subspecies of Altissima, uh, as you can see it right down here, here Gilvo canescens, its involucres are the same size range as Canadensis. So 
that may not be the best, again, depending upon which one you're looking at. FNA says that you can separate them based on this characteristic here, the um, looking at the, the middle to upper calling leaves in tall, those are gonna just be minutely serrate to entire. If there's any teeth at all, they're gonna be out more towards the tip of the leaf. Versus Canada, they say that the, um, again, the, the middle or upper leaves are clearly serrate. I've tried to look at this and match it up with the flowers and I find that um, doesn't seem like it's always that trustworthy. Uh, perhaps a more trustworthy one is the size of the disc corollas. Disc corollas here in Canada being smaller, 2.3 to 2.7, than the disc corollas up here, 3 to 3.5. But what's not on here is that characteristic I told you at the very beginning, um, I'll jump back to it real quick here, is this one right here, the size of the, of the pappus. That is consistent within each of the two varieties or subspecies within each species. So all Altissima, no matter what the variety is or subspecies, has a pappus that's bigger than all of the Canadensis, which has a pappus which is, is smaller. And I think it's, um, well, I think I've got the measurements. Well, I guess I don't have them handy right in front of me, but it's, they're, they're separated by um, uh, at least a half a millimeter or so. So that's probably, that could be the, the best characteristic because you're gonna need to have flowers though in order to do that. All right, that covers it. Um, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Uh, I'm not seeing any, uh, if anybody has a question, feel free to type it in or you can unmute yourself if you want. Um, I've got a question. Could you review briefly the differentiation between the um, white upland aster and, uh, and the white upland um, goldenrod? There's, and it's you know difference between goldenrods and aster. Just kind of review that for okay, us. Okay. So, all right. So when you're looking at yeah, this is on the. Um, on the table, uh, on the table that I don't have right handy here that I can pull up. Uh, if you look at the table, look at uh, solid eglotarmacoides, upland white, goldenrod, white flat top goldenrod is another name for it. I put similar species. Most likely, you're not going to confuse this with another goldenrod uh, because it's white. Uh, you're going to confuse it with a central trichum species. So how are you going to separate from any small white aster? I would say it comes down again to what makes a solidago a solidago right here, and what makes a symphil trichum a symphil trichum, uh, which is going to be one of the, one of the things probably will be the um, number of ray flowers. In general, solidagos do not have a lot of ray flowers. Uh, you can kind of see in some of these pictures. It can, now, the unfortunate exception might be up upland white, so maybe that won't work. There are quite a few ray flowers there. Uh, I noticed on many of the yellow ones, though, that the number of ray flowers is, you know, um, you know, le less than 10. And asters usually have quite a few more than, than that. Um, so, again, if you were to key this out, of course, the, this one here is going to separate from any symphial trichum someplace in the key that separates out the simple trichomes and solid eggos. So it would, it would be, I can't, I can't point to um, probably which of these is going to be the best because simple trichomes are radiate, just like solid eggo. Um, they're probably going to be, I bet what it might be is the, uh, the filleries. The filleries and solid eggos, they're, they're not very um, unique, I guess is one way of thinking about them. They, to me, they, and again, you can look at the, the filleries on, on these pictures here. Um, they, the filleries on most of these solid angles all look the same. Um, they don't change much. 
if you remember in central trichomes, in fact, that was one of the things that was really important. The fillories, the shape of the fillories and what they're doing um, was really an important characteristic to help to separate out different species. So I'm, I'm thinking off the top of my head here because I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the key to be sure uh, what some of those characteristics would be, but but this is where it would, would separate. I think, uh, oh, one of them was Symphil trichomes have the pappus in just one series. Solidagal have the pappus in, in two. They, they both have um, ray fluorescent sort or of pistolate. They both have disc fluorets that are perfect, so that's not going to separate them. Uh, but I, I would say the pappus and maybe the fillories uh, would probably be the more likely. Uh, thinking of the asters that are going to be most likely to look like, you know, small white flowered aster, well, heath aster, you know, maybe comes to mind as something, but you know, heath aster is going to be a lot different looking leaf wise than this. Um, but yeah, you have to start someplace. And so that's a good question. Because that's the ones we see in the ones we see in the eastern Iowa hill prairies are, you know, a foot and a half tall, very dry habitat, uh, quite a top you mean uh, for the, the, the upland white solid eagles? Or These? upland white whatever. Yeah, so the uh, upland yeah. white golden rods. Yeah, I, I didn't put golden rods Whichever on here because we're talking. That's what we're talking about. So these common names are the common name without the golden rod part. Uh, so yeah, upland white golden rods is a small plant. It, it's like, you know usually about like like that or so. It's a small plant, so that's going to separate it from some other asters. But but heath aster is you know, a small plant too. So um, just again thinking, heath aster might be the you know one that you might confuse with this, I suppose. Um, these, these have a very um, minimal amount of, and heath asters are much more branchy and dense and- Yes. Uh, yeah, well, I'll have, to get, some, I'll have yep. to get you samples. Yep, yeah, that's a good point. The asters are usually more, more branchy than what these are. In fact, golden rods aren't branchy at all for the most part. They they're branching in the inflorescence, but but not not lower down. Um, so so anything else? What, yeah, what species would be best suited for a drier, shady woodland environment? Drier, shady woodland environment. Okay, well, um, elm leaf. Uh, I mean, if you want to put something in there, if it's not there already, that that's. Uh, that would be a good one. Um, it, and it's going to be, again, up, I'm assuming sort of an upland shady environment, probably. So something that's more like more music, I suppose. Maybe a bit on the dry side. Uh, so elm leaf would be a good choice there. It's very widespread. Again, it, it occurs uh, pretty much throughout the entire state except the northwest corner. Uh, that's always an important consideration. Uh, in terms of, you know, another one that's, that's a woodland species, would be um, hairy, but hairy, uh, again, here's why, here's what everyone needs to hear. You just don't plant hairy unless you know for sure that's a correct species for your, your region, for your county. And again, if you look at the, uh, the Bonap map, which is the best that we've got, you know, basically, um, you got to be in Northeast Iowa, or you're gonna have to be in a few counties in the Des Moines River Valley. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're planting it someplace outside of its range. Uh, let's see, um, Flexicollis, of course, would be the other good one. Uh, Flexicollis, the zigzag one uh, right here. So zigzag and, and elm leaf are pretty much can't go wrong. Flexicollis is pretty much uh, statewide. Um, so again, no matter where you are in the state, uh, if you're uh, if you have a, a forest or woodland shaded type of environment that's you know music, um, then zigzag would be would be fine. Um, we do have a we have some more questions. I don't know if you want to end. It is eight oh one now. 
Um, well, I can answer a couple more. Okay. Um, let's see. Is the genus Euthamia still recognized? Yeah, so Euthamia was again um, proposed as, a, a, again, a, it is a type of a goldenrod, uh, grass leaf go goldenrod, but Euthamia is, they do clearly uh, separate out away from solidagos when you look at them, uh, look at their DNA and the molecular genetics that, that have been done. Uh, so they, they, they deservedly need to be in a different genus. Um, can you remind what the highlighted color means? Oh, the highlighted color on that table. So the green, the, the species, again, this is in the, the first column, the floor of North America name. Uh, it says up there at the top, uh, right above the table there, but yellow, uh, that means it's a species that tends to be in, you know, uh, grassland types of environments. Green is a species that would be in forested or woodland types of environments and the blue is for wetlands. So it's just a, it's a quick reference guide to the habitat type, grassland, forest or wet. And again, of course, then you get a, a much more specific kind of habitat description in the, the fourth column. And those habitat descriptions come from a, usually a variety of sources. Uh, primarily Florida, North America, since those, the people who did Florida, North America, of course, looked at thousands of vouchers uh, for each species and, and characterized the habitat that they saw um, those species coming from. So it should be a pretty good um, resource for characterizing that. Because again, I'm trying to characterize it for more of a, a North American uh, type of characterization, not just, uh, not just Iowa. Okay, what are some of your um, good beginner resources to help people with plant anatomy and identification? Well, um, I, I should have put a slide on for this. Um, I guess I always have to give a pitch to, you know, the, the um, Runkel Rusa books, the uh, Runkel Bull book, which is the, uh, the, the, the field guides that were done for Iowa. Uh, plants, wildflowers. There's one for woodlands, one for prairies, and one for wetlands. And those books um, have really good pictures. They've been redone. They've, they were revised a few years ago. I did the uh, photographs for all of the photographs for two of those books and contributed uh, some to the woodland book. Uh, they, they provide, you know, really pretty good description. Again, good picture, habitat descriptions. Um, um, Sylvan Runkle was very interested in ethnobotany, and so there's quite a bit of information about how plants were used by Native Americans and pioneers. Uh, so those books are all available, uh, usually in a bookstore, or you can get them at University of Iowa Press. So it's Wildflowers of Iowa Woodlands, Wildflowers of the Tallgrass Prairie, um, Wildflowers and Other Plants of Iowa Wetlands. Um, maybe the next Next week, I can throw a quick slide up that shows what those look like. Th those are good books just from the standpoint that, you know, they're going to be Iowa. <laughs> and so if you're in Iowa, you're going to focus on plants you're going to see. And, you know, you do have to match them up with a picture, um, but they are, they're kind of uh, arranged in the book from the earliest flowering to the latest flowering. So you can kind of use that as a guide depending upon the time of year. If you're looking for a book that um, has more of a key to it than Newcomb's Wildflower Guide is the one I use for field botany because it, um, it does have a little more structure to it. It's, it's not a technical key, not like the keys that I've been writing and, and providing for you. So it's a more of a non-technical type of a key. It's not, it's not constructed in the same way as, as the floristic key is. But it is a key that helps you uh, find a plant that you have found and looking at just like three or four basic characteristics, you can use this little key structure in, in the book to uh, find, help you find it in the book. And then once you find it in the book, then you're, you're pretty much again having to 
uh, use some descriptive characteristics or use some of the images there, the drawings, illustrations to kind of map, match it up with, with, with what you've got. But I think it, you know, it, it's, it's not very expensive and, and it certainly works. The problem with Newcombs, of course, is that it covers the entire Eastern half of, of North America. So uh, there's gonna be lots of species covered in there that um, you're not gonna see here. That's always the, the challenge. And that's why regional ones usually are probably a little bit more useful to you than something that covers you know, the whole uh, half of the country. There's, there's certainly lots of them out there. Every, every state usually has some you know, field guides done by someone within the state. You know. And then these websites that you've got right here, these, these websites are really very good. Uh, Minnesota Wildflowers is really good. Lots of pictures of the plants uh, vegetatively, floristically. Missouri Plants is good as well. Um, you can use those as online field guides. Well, is that it? Yeah, there's one final question is oh, okay. uh, asking about Wichita goldenrod. Do you know what that is? Which species? Uh, what's the name of it again? Wichita goldenrod. Uh, Wichita. Um, I don't know that one. It doesn't grow in Iowa, I don't think. Uh, I mean, I've never heard that common name before. I think it, it might be obviously one in the Wichita mountains down in um, Oklahoma, I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not, um, never seen it. <laughs> and I assume that's, that's, it's probably endemic to that area, most likely. Right. So it's kind of probably combined to that, that area there. Sorry, all right. that's all I can tell you on that one. <laughs> okay. Well, that's all, all right. we got there. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, glad you could come. Um, now I can see a few uh, faces here before you all say goodbye, I guess. Hey, James. <laughs>